the brain is basically built from the bottom up. First, the ba brain builds basic circuits that are responsible for basic skills, and, and then more complex circuits are built on top of those basic circuits as we develop more complex skills. Biologically, the brain is prepared to be shaped by experience. It's expecting um, the experiences that a young child has to literally influence the formation of its circuitry. It's built into our biology. The interaction between genetics and experience that shapes brain architecture is embedded in the reciprocal relationship, relationships that children have with the adults in their lives. And by that we mean um, what we refer to as the serve and return nature of children's interaction with their own adults. Development and the impact of experience on development is not a one-way street. It's a back-and-forth interaction. The brain is a highly integrated organ, which has multiple sections that specialize in different um, uh, kind of processes. So we have parts of the brain that are involved more in cognitive function and other parts that are involved in processing of emotion and parts involved in seeing and hearing. So if a child is emotionally uh, kind of well put together, and socially competent, that will affect more positive and productive learning. And if a child is preoccupied with fears or anxiety or is dealing with considerable stress, no matter how intellectually gifted that child might be, his or her learning is going to be impaired by that kind of emotional interference. NASA has just released a new image captured by the Hubble Space Telescope, revealing what it looked like moments before galactic clusters, cosmic cl clusters that consist of many galaxies held together by gravity smashed into each other. The result of this cosmic collision of galaxy clusters was the formation of a new massive structure called Max J0416.1-2403, or simply Max J0416, that lies roughly 4.3 billion light years from Earth in the constellation Eridanus. Pictures of galactic clusters sometimes don't look real, because every single one of the tiny, stereotypically spiral disks in the image above looks an awful lot like they were just photoshopped haphazardly onto a black background. But these images are completely real and also incredible, because each one of those galaxies contains billions of stars and countless planets, just like our own Milky Way contains the planets and the stars of our solar system. To create the image above, which the team is calling the Cosmic Kaleidoscope, researchers combined data captured by three different telescopes set to capture individual parts of the sky. As the team explains, the image of the cluster combines data from three different telescopes, the NASA slash ESA Hubble Space Telescope showing the galaxy and stars, the NASA Chandra X-ray Observatory diffuse emission in blue, and the NRAO Jansky Very Large Array diffuse emission in pink, each telescope shows a different element of the cluster, allowing astronomers to study Max J0416 in detail. As you've probably noticed, we live in a world defined by three spatial dimensions and one dimension of time. In other words, it only takes three numbers to pinpoint your physical location at any given moment. On Earth, these coordinates break down to longitude, latitude, and altitude, representing the dimensions of length, width, and height, or depth. Slap a time step on those coordinates and you're pinpointed in time as well. To strip that down even more, a one-dimensional world would be like a single bead on a measured thread. You can slide the bead forward and you can slide the bead backward, but you only need one number to figure out its exact location on the string. Length. Where's the bead? At the 6 inch, 15 centimeter mark. 
Now, let's upgrade to a two-dimensional world. This is essentially a flat map, like the playing field in games such as Battleship or Chess. You just need length and width to determine location. In Battleship, all you have to do is say E5, and you know the location is a convergence of the horizontal E and the vertical line 5. Now let's add one more dimension. Our world factors height or depth into the equation. While locating a submarine's exact location in Battleship only requires two numbers, a real-life submarine would demand a third coordinate of depth. Sure, it might be charging along the surface, but it might also be hiding 800 feet beneath the waves. Which will it be? Could there be a fourth spatial dimension? Well, that's a tricky question because we currently can't perceive or measure anything beyond the dimensions of length, width, and height. Just as three numbers are required to pinpoint a location in a three-dimensional world, a four-dimensional world would require a fourth. So we are going to start with the intuitive definition of temperature everybody has. So hang on to that. That's the right, uh, right intuition. But as physicists, of course, we want to be more precise, more careful. So let's say you have the notion of hot and cold. Even that requires a little more uh, precision. That introduces the notion of what is called thermodynamic equilibrium, just like mechanical equilibrium. This is a very important concept. So I'll tell you what equilibrium is with a concrete example. If you take a cup of hot water, then you take another cup of cold water. Each cup, if you wait it sufficiently long, is said to be in a state of equilibrium as long as the cups were isolated from the outside world and not allowed to cool down or heat up we think they maintain a certain temperature. We say it's in a state of thermal equilibrium because this temperature does not seem to change. Now, we've not defined what temperature is precisely, but we can talk about whether whatever it is has changed or not changed. So it will settle down to some temperature. It will maintain the temperature. Be very careful. If you leave a cup of coffee in this room, it will cool down because the room has got a different temperature. But I'm talking about a cup of coffee that's been isolated from everything. It maintains the temperature. Here's another cup of a cold drink with, at what we feel is a lower temperature. They are both in a state of equilibrium. Although coffee was not an important export commodity in Vietnam until the 1990s, the original coffee cultivation in Indochina began in the early 19th century and was organized by missionaries. Throughout French colonial rule in Vietnam, coffee production occurred mainly on plantations as the French strongly encouraged the cultivation of coffee for export. Relative to lowland rice, the prominent export of the time, coffee cultivation proved to be more difficult than anticipated, which severely limited the expansion of coffee production. The majority of the original coffee trees in Vietnam were of the Arabica variety. However, the Himalay Vastatrix attacked the Arabica plants and depleted the output from 64.5% in 1945 to 1.7% 1 in 1957. The only coffee to survive this disease was the Robusta variety, Canopora, which is the type of coffee currently produced in Vietnam. After this disease eliminated nearly all of the coffee plants in Vietnam, the French colonial administration rescinded their encouragement of coffee cultivation and instead suggested that its inhabitants concentrate on annual crops such as rice. After the end of French colonial rule in 1954, the new government in Vietnam began to again encourage coffee cultivation. In the late 1970s, the government provided incentives of clear and fertile land to induce the ethnic majority to migrate to the less populated highland region and produce coffee. 
This policy proved to be successful as seen in the increase in population density in the highlands from three persons per square kilometer in 1940 to 77 persons per square kilometer in 1997. So the rats that do a lot of licking and grooming, and there are rats, rats that do very little, but most rats are in between. So that resembles uh, human, human behavior as well, right? You have mothers that are highly mothering and mo mothers that couldn't care less, and most mothers are somewhere in between. So if you look at these rats, so all you do, you observe them and you put them in separate cages. So you put the high lickers in one cage, not the mothers, but the offspring, and the low lickers in another cage, and then you let them grow, and they're adults now. Their mothers are long buried. And you look in the brain, and you see that those who had high licking mothers express a lot of glucocorticoid receptor gene, and those who are low lickers express very little. That reflects a number of receptors, and that results in a different stress response. But this is not the only difference. <coughs> we found later on there are hundreds of genes that are differently expressed. So if you get a mutation, you know, a polymorphism once in a million, here just the motherly love changes hundreds of genes in one shot. And it changes them in a very stable way that you can look at the old rat and you can say whether it was licked or not. But you can also say it by behavior. So if you walk to the cages, to the room, the rats that were poorly licked are highly anxious, hard to handle, aggressive. And, and the rats that were very well handled as, as, off, as little pups, they are much more relaxed, much easier to handle. So, you know, like every technician in the lab knows, looking at the adult rat, how it was licked when it was a little pup. And the question, of course, is... Let's take a look at this video of these little kids. They were offered the option of having one marshmallow immediately or two marshmallows 15 minutes later. And you've got some very cute videotape of this experiment, so let's take a look. Okay. What we found is um, a very simple and direct way of measuring a competence that seems to make an important life difference. A researcher tells these preschoolers that she's going to leave the room. If they wait for her to come back without eating the marshmallows, they'll get two marshmallows. Mm. Or they can ring the bell and she'll come back right away. But then they only get one marshmallow. I won't ring the bell. You won't ring the bell? Okay. Looking at children over time, Dr. Michelle has found that being able to wait longer at four has some pretty powerful implications. And what are those powerful implications? Is that uh, that later in life they're more disciplined and have more self-control? Is that pretty much it? Well, they are more likely to achieve their life goals. They have better relationships. They did better on their SAT tests. I know, that's they, crazy. All because they waited 15 minutes for well, two marshmallows? I mean, I think it is crazy. I probably would have eaten all three. But <laughs> Yeah, me too. <laughs> but. Um, you know, actually, yes, uh, the ability to be able to to pursue your goals, in this case it was to have two marshmallows versus one, and not go on automatic and just grab the marshmallow, is a very important skill. But I think a main point in Mind in the Making is that these skills can be caught, taught if you're 14 or 40 or, or 4. It's not ever too late, and any child can learn them, any adult can teach them, and it's never too late.